My name is Dr. Catherine Hughes from Crime Psych. I'm a criminal psychologist and I run a business that enables me to bring knowledge and learning to everybody, not just those who are studying at colleges or university. And I do this by producing blogs and vlogs, videos like this, as well as free online courses. But I also run some very slightly more in-depth courses, both available online and face-to-face -face, on a range of subjects within criminal psychology. You don't need any previous experience to learn with me. So after this video, head on over to my website and have a look what's available. This particular video is looking at Stephen Paddock, who was the Las Vegas shooter. Thank you so much to Joe Turner for suggesting this offender for a psychological analysis. I always begin by taking a look at the background of the person that I'm doing a psychological analysis of. There are usually always some clues in the offender's background that could be in indicative of their behaviour, but not this time. This time's a little bit different. This guy seemed quite settled and somewhat normal. He grew up being brought up by his mum. His dad was in prison. However, he didn't really have that much contact with his father anyway. He was one of four children and the family were not all that wealthy. Uh, but he did go to high school and he went on to university. And there's nothing really very much to note during these years, not that I could find about him anyway. He worked in a few different jobs, such as being a postal worker, an auditor, and later going into real estate with his brother. Stephen Paddock did quite well for himself and he worked his way up to owning several properties and earning a decent wage. In fact, the IRS records indicated that he earned five to six million dollars profit on the real estate that he owned. He did gamble, but he wasn't known to be a prolific gambler or to have excessive gambling debts. In later years, he used to enjoy playing video poker during the night and he slept during the day because he didn't like being out in the sun. He was married twice. Both times were for fairly short periods of time. However, he remained on friendly terms with both of his ex-wives. He wasn't involved in any extremist groups. He didn't belong to any political groups. He didn't even belong to any gun clubs or any shooting ranges. In his later years, he lived in a couple of retirement villages with his Filipino girlfriend. And the pair of them would enjoy holidays, they'd enjoy trips away together regularly. He kept a fairly low profile within his community. They went on cruises, he had his own pilot's licence. He also had no prior conviction or interactions with the law. During the last few months of his life, Stephen Paddock was known to drink too much and he would regularly smell of alcohol early in the morning. He'd been prescribed Valium as an anti-anxiety drug on three occasions. We do know that the effects of Valium can be magnified by alcohol, and this may have been a contributing factor to his behaviour. The sheriff from Clark County reported that Paddock had lost a significant amount of money and wealth since 2015, which led him to have episodes of depression. One night in October 2017, he opened fire on a large crowd of partygoers from his hotel room. He killed 58 people that night, including himself. He fired more than 1,100 rounds from the Mandalay Bay Hotel, killing 58 people and injuring 851 people. It is recorded that prior, the year prior to the shooting, he increased his purchasing of guns and accessories. His girlfriend at the time did notice, but she just assumed that it was a hobby. In the absence of any prior indication or warning, it is fairly reasonable to assume that there would be nothing to worry about and that he was simply developing a new interest or an increased interest in a legal activity. This is the point where the planning must have started for Stephen Paddock. He purchased his girlfriend a plane ticket to her home and once she was there, he sent her money to buy a property there. Stephen Paddock arrived in Las Vegas six days before the shooting took place. 
The hotel porters helped him to carry around nine suitcases in total to his hotel room, which contained a range of lethal equipment. He was known in Vegas as a high spending gambler, but Vegas is notorious for not asking questions of their guests. And so taking so many suitcases up to his hotel room for a short stay wouldn't have been questioned. Stephen Paddock planned the shooting meticulously. He planned every last detail. He had surveillance cameras outside the room so he could see who was coming. He screwed the doors to the floor shut prior to the attack as well. The police found details notes inside the room which show that he was calculating the trajectory of the bullets to the concert. Several members of staff, security and police were shot in the attack. It's also reported that Paddock may have planned to attack other events before Vegas. He'd researched large-scale venues in cities such as Boston since at least May 2017, and he'd reserved a room overlooking the August 2017 Lollapalooza Festival in Chicago, but he didn't use that room. This was a man who was intent on causing harm to a large number of people. This does indicate that he may have been suffering some kind of mental illness. However, in the absence of any full psychological assessment, it would be impossible and fairly irresponsible to say what these conditions might have been. There was clearly some catastrophic event or perhaps a series of smaller difficult events that led to a breakdown in his thinking and in his reasoning. Some of you who are watching this may very well have gotten to a point in your life that things become so extremely difficult to deal with that you feel overwhelmed, where one thing after another just goes wrong and you end up feeling hopeless and desperate. This is usually the point at which people decide that some extreme action is needed. Their lives have become so unmanageable that they're driven to act out doing something extreme. Granted, it's not always shooting at someone, but it could be things like leaving a relationship, moving home or resigning from a job. Things in life become so overwhelming and so unmanageable that we sometimes can't see any reasonable way out. Even I've been in this position before now. For me, it was a case of being trapped in an abusive relationship which I believed I couldn't escape from. It was a feeling of not having any decent options available to choose from. And I believe that this is the point that Stephen Paddock had gotten to. There were no other options available, no reasonable actions for him to take, only extreme ones. There was no light at the end of the tunnel, and for him, it was a case of showing the world how angry he was and taking out his frustration and his resentment out on strangers, which ended with self-sacrifice. Either it, He was either going to shoot himself or he knew that the police were going to shoot him when they found him. Thankfully, in my case, it ended with a new life that turned out much better because of the decisions that I made I made the choices that were available to me at the time. We as humans always choose the path of least resistance. We choose options that seem to be most acceptable to us. And most importantly, we choose options that are easily available and easily accessible. I can understand and empathize with the person who's gotten to that point where they feel so desperate because they can't deal with themselves, their lives, or other people. This isn't to say that I advocate mass shootings, I certainly don't. However, we really must stop villainizing mental health issues. We mustn't make lethal weapons easier to access than mental health support. It wasn't just mental health issues that led to this mass shooting. It was most likely a combination of many factors, which might have included a lack of appropriate support, societal expectations, ease of access to lethal weapons, as well as many other factors. 
This analysis did begin with me trying to figure out what psychological factors had caused Stephen Paddock to open fire on people attending a party in Las Vegas. All of the media reports and online accounts either directly blame or hint towards this being caused by mental illness. This claim might have some truth to it in a case such as this, but it did lead me to research the wider problem of mass shootings in America to find out what we do know about it. We know that mass killings are quite rare, mass shootings are even more rare. We know that the media give a great deal of attention and coverage to episodes such as this, and probably rightly so, because we ought to know about this kind of thing when it occurs. However, there is a tendency for people in general to believe that mass killers are either mad or bad. Whenever there are mass shootings, people want and need some kind of an explanation for that person's actions. They need something or someone to blame. The argument normally always comes back to gun laws and firearm availability in America and mental illness. After all, if a seemingly normal person can be driven to go out and kill hundreds of strangers, they can't be thinking straight, can they? So therefore they must be mentally ill, or as most people think anyway. People call for tighter legislations against supplying those who are mentally ill with firearms. Unfortunately, though, this leads to people to fear those who are suffering from mental illnesses. Research has shown that Americans fear those with mental health issues more so now than they ever did in the past. So does this mean that people should fear me more because I've suffered from mental health issues of anxiety and depression in the past then? Or is it just the really serious mental health cases such as schizophrenics that we should fear from having guns? I have a close friend who has dissociative personality disorder. So does that mean that she should be feared or isolated in some way? I can tell you from direct close-up personal experience, it isn't those who have a diagnosed mental health condition that you should fear from shooting you. It's the happy-go-lucky, cheeky chappy who'll do anything for anyone and always knows a man who can do whatever it is that you need to do, that they're the ones that we should be more fearful of. Let me outline exactly what I know from my own personal experience. And I'm not talking about my experience as a criminal psychologist either. I live in the UK, and so gun crimes are not as big of an issue here as they are in the USA. However, I grew up and lived on a council estate where crime rates can be higher because it's a deprived area. Gun crimes do exist, but at a much lower level in this country. I once dated somebody who was associated with some people who were connected to a large gang. Now, obviously, I didn't know that at the time. Obviously, I wouldn't have been dated them otherwise. But one evening at a family party, there was a knock at the door and mass panic erupted amongst all the family members because there were two men at the door with guns threatening to take action if a debt wasn't paid. Now, I knew nothing about this before it had happened, but I was involved nonetheless. I was very young, I was terrified, and I feared for my life. I didn't report it to the police at the time because there was absolutely nothing for me to report. I didn't know who these people were or why they'd called. I didn't even get to see their faces or even see their guns, so I couldn't really have given much useful information over to the police anyway. Now, obviously, that relationship finished the very same day. But that family seemed like such a lovely family and they were really kind and they were nice to me. There was nothing obvious about them that would have indicated the sorts of activities that they were involved in. On the other side of the coin is a lovely young lady that I know who has multiple personalities. She has been in mental health institutions and she struggles with her mental health every day. She struggles with her thoughts every day. 
However, I am 100% confident that she would never kill another person, no matter how intrusive her thoughts became. So you tell me, which one is more dangerous? The person with a perceived chip on the shoulder who thinks the world's done them wrong, think the world owes them a living, or the young lady who tries her hardest to cope every day with an illness that she has. I know for sure which one of them two would shoot and kill people if they were given access to a gun. Mass shootings understandably create an outpouring of public horror and outrage. Nonetheless, mass shootings are extremely rare events. These tragedies are influenced by multiple complex factors, many of which we still don't fully understand because they're so rare. However, many people believe that the perpetrator has some kind of a mental illness most of the time. It's undoubtedly true that some mass shooters do have a history of mental illness or psychiatric illnesses, but there's no reliable data to suggest that this is a cause or indication of going on to become a mass shooter. As a result, debate on how to prevent mass shooting has focused heavily on issues that are highly politicised, grossly oversimplified and unlikely to result in any productive solutions. Because mass shootings are extremely rare, they can't be predicted especially by anybody outside of the perpetrator's social circle. There's very little evidence in the research that could better inform mental health professionals or law enforcement professionals regarding the problems that lead individuals to commit mass murder. Research on mass shootings has indicated that the individuals who carry out these sorts of acts are experiencing extreme anger and revenge, feelings of social, social alienation, and they plan these events well in advance. Most mass shooters don't plan to survive the attacks and they either die by suicide or being shot by the police. They typically feel very alienated and hold grudges and have a, quite a paranoid mindset. I do hope that you've enjoyed this psychological analysis of Stephen Paddock, the Las Vegas shooter. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Let me know what you think about the case in the comments below. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Bye for now.